Hey everyone, welcome back. This is part three of the ECS system. So in this system, uh, I want to talk about the actual, like, I want to build the skeleton of the system. I think that's where we're going to start. So for our purposes, I'm really talking about this little UML diagram that we have here. Specifically, I think it needs to change. Um, I'll do it here in yellow. I think it needs to change because right now we have the manager owning the entities, which in turn have references to these components. So the question is, where do the components live? So I'm gonna take a little bit of a detour here and talk about where these components um, probably should live and, and the decision that I've made here. So I think what we need to do is we need to do this. I think the manager needs to own them like this. So this is how I think components should be stored. And so this of course goes, it's still entities, they still have a reference to components. So you know, if I want to be more exact, I would do this. And then I would just kill this. So I think this is the this is the right call here. And the reason why is because we want to have a nice serializable or serialized array of things, right? So if I have an array of things, uh, CPU cache is very happy with me walking through this. I think we're gonna be walking through arrays quite a bit. Whereas if I have an entity that has pointers everywhere and I walk through the entities, this is slow. Now, amusingly, we're actually not gonna do anything that much different because this guy might have something to this, this guy might have something to this other list, you know, maybe there's another one with this other list, but it doesn't, these don't matter that much because we're not directly looping through them. In fact, the entity manager is not going to be talking to the entity directly at all. So that's the idea for this, and that's that's like the change that I that I've wanted to make here. So our new system will reflect that. And here I've just redrawn that same UML diagram a uh, little bit bigger and more explicit with our concrete systems and so on here. I've um, also added a couple of functions. So systems, uh, as we know, update, they probably need to initialize. Uh, these are just virtual functions that you'll override. Remember, a system update is significant, so it's likely going to blow the cache anyway. I don't really care that much about a virtual call here. Uh, entity is going to have some um, is going to have this this sort of whatever some reference to its set of components and components have a virtual init function which take in this data it needs some kind of data to be able to initialize itself and in general I'm going to use polymorphism for um, instantiation and destruction and sort of initialization that kind of stuff and I'm going to try and pull away from it for pretty much anything else or with the exception of the system update, this guy here. Uh, okay, so that's it, let's look at the code. And here it is. So I basically have created a tiny little skeleton and it requires a little bit of additional explanation. So I'll just very briefly on this. Um, I have a library, I have a couple of just utility functions and classes and things in here. So you'll see those throughout. I'm writing this for my own engine, so uh, I'm going to be using some of those tools. Most of it is going to be pretty canon, though. Um, the only somewhat wonky one that you're probably going to see is the logging system, which is here, and this is an example of it being used. It's just a way for me to log stuff and be able to compile it out in release mode and all that stuff. So what I have is I have this application class, which we can look at. Um, it just has an initialization and an update. The initialization and update do nothing, except return appropriately. Uh, I have a bunch of files here because it's not super fun to watch me create a bunch of files, but there's literally nothing in any of them except some maybe an include. So these are just the things that I think we're going to need. Um, it builds and runs. You know, it doesn't do anything except ticks three times and then ends, right? So you can kind of see what it's doing here. Uh, it just calls update and then it sleeps for 500 milliseconds and that's about it. Okay, let's talk about this system itself. So we have uh, this guy, which is our basic UML diagram. So let's just start filling out some of this stuff. So at the top, we're basically gonna have this, this concept called an entity manager. 
And the entity manager is going to be the thing that holds all of that stuff. Um, actually, before we do that, let's define a couple of types, or one type in particular. We know that we're going to want some kind of entity ID, so we'll just create it. Um, maybe this will become a 64-bit value at some point. Maybe not. This entity systems types is where I'm going to throw these types of little like type defs for a system. Let's see. So back into entity component, sorry, uh, entity manager. So here we know that we're going to have um, our entity manager with three major things. It's going to have uh, a bunch of systems, basically an array of systems, uh, some array or something of entities, and uh, some array or something of all the components. So we have our, uh, our constraints. Um, we know, in fact, we've already decided down here how we're going to store our systems, right? How are systems stored? Number three, an array of pointers. So we'll just start with that right now. Um, I'm going to include... So uh, I use EASTL. Um, check it out. If you if you Google for, for it, you'll find it. Uh, but I use it because it's basically faster and better in almost every way. Um, you could replace most of the code that I write. It's, it's all STL compatible, so you could re replace most of this, right? I'm going to do EASTL vector. Uh, and I'll call them component systems. Star M uh, systems. So we're just going to start very simply with this. Oops. So that, that's pretty much it. Um, oh, and for fun, oh, no, it's in here. So entity, where are you? System types. So we have all the types here as well. So this is how our systems are going to be stored. Um, how about our entities? So we've already decided. Um, you probably didn't see this decision, but they're not going to be pure IDs because we want to be able to store references to these components. Most of the time, we're not looping through entities. Most of the time, we're actually looking up an entity based on its ID. So we have a couple of options. Um, option one, and, and we'll look at it briefly, is I do something like this. Um, right? And entities themselves are... Um, entities themselves are like stored contiguously, all this other stuff. So um, the ID for an entity is this index. So then we have to ask ourselves what happens with an, when an entity is destroyed. I don't know. That's going to be a tricky one, right? So if I have this array, here are my entities. This entity is destroyed. We have a couple of options. Uh, option number one, we create some kind of free list so that I know which slots are available for me. And if that free list is empty, I just append to the end, you know, something like that. Um, that could work. That'd be fine, probably. Um, but there's another issue on top of this. The other issue is this would be ID one. So if this entity goes away, I'm now going to have to notify every single system that cares about this entity that this entity is dead. And that's a thing, right? I can just throw an event, and people can respond to that event and say, hey, is this an entity I care about? But I don't think that's the right call. I think what I want and what makes the most sense to me is every entity ID ever generated in the system is unique. And it helps with things like saving and loading so that I can save and say, hey, like, I have a pet. That pet belongs to this other entity, and I can do it by ID. Um, or some component can care, something like that. Um, those, those things can really help because you can save the IDs and restore those IDs. So I think that this is maybe not the way to go. Most of the time, we're trying to look up an entity by its ID. That's the vast majority of the cases. So this would be super fast. Um, so that's a big advantage. For now, right, they're both, it's constant. For now, I think I want to do a hash table. I think that's the right call. At least that's what I'm leaning towards. This may change. Um, an EASTL to hash map. What do you want? You want to include it? Um, and it's going to be entity ID to 
entity. And it could, oops, and it could be a pointer or it could be the entity itself. I sort of think it doesn't matter. Um, if the, the problem is that if the hash table has to grow, um, I'd have to look at the code and see if it tries to do a copy construct or something, if it tries to do a copy assignment. But we can see that pretty easily. So entities, we'll look at it like this. The last thing we need are the actual components. And we know that we want these to be essentially vectorized. But here's the problem. I can't just do like, you know, renderable, you know, renderable. So I mean, I could, I guess, but this seems lame, right? And then I have a bunch of these. Here's all, here, here's every component I have in the game. And there could be dozens or, you know, hundreds. Right, I mean, how many components do you have? Let's see. To make the math easy, let's push this to line uh, 20. I guess 21, so it starts with a one. I mean, how many do you want? If we have a hundred of, if we have a hundred components, this is less than a hundred components, and a hundred components seems perfectly reasonable. Furthermore, this is going to live on an engine, uh, and there's a game layer associated with this, right? There's somewhere there's some game layer that needs to be able to add custom components. And I can't do that easily here unless like I'm inheriting entity manager and then add my own there. This just seems nightmarish to me. So we don't want that. Well, another option is we could do some kind of like thing like this. The problem here, of course, is these are not going to be serialized. They're going to be wherever they happen to be in memory. We can force the issue a little bit if we use some kind of memory pool or something. Um, and in fact, if we create a special, its own interface, we can actually get around this entirely. So here's the thing. Uh, components. You know, I'm going to put a bunch of question marks to do. I have a plan for this, which I think is going to work, uh, but I'll cover it in another video. So the rest is just plugging in a bunch of code um, and, and making it work. So like the entity system, we know that the entity system, if we go back to our thing here, it's going to have basically two functions and they're going to be vir uh, pure virtual functions. So, um, the basic entity system will look something like, you know, entity, I could say like entity component system. I'm going to say for now component system. What did I call it? Component system, yeah. Um, and it's just going to have, you know, bool, uh, oops, virtual bool init. And maybe I'll pass in some data. I don't know. Um, but for right now, this is fine. Uh, virtual void update delta time. I probably don't need a double for this, but I'm using it uh, for right now. I don't mean this is component system. Oh, one more thing because it is a um, it's a polymorphic base class, right? We have to do this. So that's it. That's component system. Uh, I am calling this entity component system. Maybe I'll just say component system. <clears throat> um, so now we have an entity component itself. So components, I mean, are just as easy. Easy enough that I'm basically going to copy and paste this. Um, they're this easy, right? And then this is sort of a thing. I'm going to let this go. Um, I'm just going to say void star p description uh, in my own sort of language. Uh, an entity description is their their data. I'm calling this void star because we're going to have to look at another way to pass this data in. Um, and I'll go over that uh, also in another video. So component system, uh, the component itself, there's not really anything in here. Um, now we need to look at the entity. The entity should be relatively straightforward. Um, it's basically going to look something like this. 
So we're gonna have this class component. I should include um, entity system type so that we know what that is. Uh, I should include hash map so that we know what that is. There we go. Uh, so this is a thing I've made up, entity component ID. I don't know what that's gonna be, but based on some ID, we wanna be able to look up a pointer to, the pointer to your entity. That's kind of where we're at right now. Um, and it may have some functions and things on it, right? Um, the entity itself has an ID, um, so I could pass it in. I have, I have other ways of making this work, um, but for right now, we'll just say we'll pass it in. And we will make this an explicit function so that it has to be this type. And for fun, um, we'll create a little getter. And that's kind of it. Um, you know, getting a component should be relatively straightforward. Uh, and that's kind of all I wanted to go over. One thing that I will do here in application, like this is probably where the entity manager and entity manager is going to live. You know, I can include it here. Whoops. Um, so, you know, and then this guy will, will initialize it. So we have since this is the only thing, I'll just say return m entity manager dot init. Almost certainly it's going to have some initialization, you know, stuff like this. And then this can be the same thing of some kind of like update. So m entity manager dot update. Uh, at the time we have to do some, you know, to do time stuff, right? We have to do some timekeeping stuff. So it'll look something like this. Um, the entity manager, whoops, of course, is gonna need these functions, you know? So I'm doing all this bool init stuff, incidentally, because I believe in uh, two-stage initialization. So the constructor will only set things to reasonable values. And the reason is because I don't, you know, games in general don't use exceptions. And you really, like constructors by definition can't fail. So um, I put it in a reasonably sort of uninitialized state. And then I call init and then it's good to go. Because init can fail and say, hey, this object is not going to be valid. That's it. I mean, there's not a lot else to go over here. I just wanted to get the skeleton going and show you some basic code. Um, I will show you one thing that I'm kind of thinking just for fun. Um, how do we get a component? You know, you get, you've probably seen these types of functions in Unity and everywhere else. So, you get it like this. This is almost certainly what um, Unity does. It does something like this, right? Many of these types of things do. So you say, oops, components dot, com, uh, components dot find, and then we have to, you know, the ID. So component knows what type it is. So I'm thinking it'll be something like this. Find it is not equal. And then of course this is just, you know, boilerplate stuff of like, hey, did you find it? Return, find it dot second. Um, and then this is just return null pointer. So to return null if it doesn't have it. And that's kind of it, like this type of thing, you'll see this be, this pattern being used in multiple places. So this just lets us get it without specifically having or really knowing what the component is because there's gonna be a version of this function for every you know type. So that's it. Um, I'm gonna end the video here. Um, a lot of the feedback I've been getting is people want shorter videos. So you know this one's still about a half an hour. So I'm gonna end here. Next, uh, in the next video, we're going to go into more detail about what a component ID is, how it's going to be used, and really, if I can fit it all in, I'm going to go and talk about uh, this whole thing here, this guy. We're going to try and answer this question a bit, and I don't know if we're going to get through the entire implementation of it because uh, it could be super complicated. Uh, but at the very least, we'll talk about it conceptually, and then another video will go over the full implementation of it. This will be one of the more pseudo-tricky parts of this. The rest of this is pretty straightforward.
So that's it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, comments, and all that fun stuff is always great. Uh, and I'll see you next time.